Hi everyone, this is Petra McGowan and welcome to the Reef Resilience webinar on Assessing Coral Reef Resilience in Saipan CNMI. Um, as you guys know from past webinars, I'm the program manager for the Reef Resilience program and I'm your host for the session. The webinar is brought to you by the generous support of John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. We're going to begin the webinar with a presentation and we're going to end with questions from those in the audience. There's two ways you can ask questions. You can use the question box at any time throughout the webinar and send questions. We're going to keep track of those for the end of the webinar. Or you can raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon in the toolbar on the left of the list of attendees. If you're having any technical difficulties, trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can also send a question and let us know so we can try to resolve the issue during the webinar. So before I introduce the presenter, I wanted to get an idea how many of you have done or are planning to do a resilience assessment. So we have a poll. Let me see. Take a second and fill out the poll and let us know, have you done or are you planning to do a resilience assessment? I'm waiting for the results. Oh, okay. So this will be good for Steve to know. So you're dealing with some folks that have done resilience assessments and there's some that might be interested. So that's thanks for filling out our poll. And I now want to introduce our and welcome our presenter. Steve McKagan is a fisheries biologist working for the NOAA Fisheries Pacific Islands Regional Office in the field office on Saipan. He received his master's degree in ocean systems and climate change from UC Santa Barbara, where he worked on modeling and oceanographic primary production. Steve previously worked for the CNMI Division of Fish and Wildlife before moving to his position at NOAA, and we're excited to have him presenting today on his work with the first field-based trial looking at the 11 variables for reef resilience put forth by McClanahan um, in 2012. Thanks, Steve, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, great, thanks. Pull up the slideshow here. So this work definitely would not have happened without a lot of support from both Jeff Maynard and Stephen Johnson, um, both of whom have done some presentations regarding this work or in the resiliency field previously. So um, I'm going to focus most of this on what we did here in Saipan, but you may have seen some of this information presented in other places, depending on how, how much you follow this work. Um, and this project actually spun Hold off on. from... Sorry, your... Steve, not seeing your slides right now. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm not. Unless I didn't get. I didn't get the prompt. We just had the prompt up a minute ago. This time I didn't get it. Okay. Let's try to. Let's make sure those get up. Hold on okay. one sec. So thanks to everybody who was able to um, figure out the slight time change. I know that could be confusing. <laughs> I was a little confused myself. So glad you all could make it. I see some folks from the CNMI on there, which is great. Um, so, let's see, Steve, okay, are you I got seeing it? Now. it? Yeah, okay. it just came up. And is everyone else seeing it now? Yep, now I see great. it. Okay, great. So this project actually spun off from a 2009 TNC-sponsored resiliency workshop on Guam. Um, after attending that meeting, and that was in my first year of transitioning from DFW to NOAA, I saw a real need to try to put more climate change research into the work that was being done here locally. So big thanks to TNC, both for the inspiration from this work and then the opportunity to share it here today. So a quick outline here. We're going to do a little background on the CNMI and the history of climate change. We'll be short on that. Um, we'll talk about why resilience is important and how we look at it. Um, we'll look at some of the findings from our work, applications for management, um, we'll look at where we're headed next, and then we'll have a bunch of time for questions at the end, um, which I hope is really interactive. So for those of you who've never um, been to the Marianas Islands, you should really come visit. 
we have one of the most consistent climates on the planet as both the air and water temperatures seldom range much from 80 degrees. Um, if you're a diver, we have some of the best visibility in the world. And the CNMI also has a rich history with Spanish, German, and Japanese occupation. Our islands played a major role in World War II with both local battles and an airstrip on Tinian, which was responsible for the launch of the Enola Gay that eventually bombed Hiroshima. Um, we have two indigenous cultures in the CNMI, the Chamorro and the Carolinian, and an economy that is dri driven almost completely by the tourist industry, especially since the exodus of the garment industry here over the last decade. In the most recent census, the total population of the CNMI was around 50,000 people, 90% of those living on Saipan. Um, we typically think of the archipelago as being divided into the north uninhabited islands and the southern inhabited islands. The southern islands have a much more well-developed reef structure, so those are Saipan, Tinian, Rota, and Guam. And the reefs in the CNMI can be distinguished into four types, really depending on the amount of influence they have from the local aquifer, what the wave exposure is at the sites, and then the inherent geological development. Um, so this map is actually taken from the Marianas Trench Monument site. The big red polygon is the trench portion of the monument. Um, the northern three islands are the islands unit, which is a no fishing area. And then there's also a volcanic unit of that monument, which is sprinkled amongst um, a lot of the pinnacles throughout the chain. So like all other jurisdictions and island communities, the CNMI is concerned about climate change and how it will affect our community, our economy, and our culture. Um, so what we know is that 500 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide have been released into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that the atmospheric CO2 has gone from 280 parts per million to 393, I think, as of the last month or so. Um, once we passed 300 parts per million, we actually exceeded the highest level that we've seen in the atmosphere of the Earth in over 400,000 years. So that's why a lot of scientists will say that we've reached what they call a no analog future. Or if you look back at the climate record, there's no example in history that we can look at to predict what we'll see here in the coming years based on these new levels. Um, so this has a direct impact on corals. If we think about coral life cycles and we think about greenhouse gases and warming of the atmosphere and then the warming of the ocean that accompanies that, we see that corals are expected to be impacted negatively throughout fertilization, their pelagic phases, and their juvenile and adult growth stages. So there's really not a phase in the life cycle of corals that we don't think ocean warming will at some point impact them. But if that wasn't bad enough, um, a lot of the carbon dioxide that's entering the atmosphere isn't just contributing to greenhouse gases. More than 50% of that we found is actually entering the oceans. And so what we see here is an increase in ocean acidity or ocean acidification or OA as it's now often called. And for corals this is more bad news. From the life stages of the coral you see that again just about every life stage is going to be impacted in some way or another by increase in ocean acidification. So along with these global, global stresses, I think all island communities, especially those that are inhabited, have local stresses. And for us in CNMI, it's no different. Sedimentation, nutrient loading, and then uh, changes in the balance of herbivory are really key and problematic for our corals. So in 2008, Kent Carpenter put out a big publication in Science that said one-third of reef-building corals face elevated extinction risk to climate change from global and local impacts. And if you look at the new IPCC models, which just came out over the last couple of months, I, my guess is that that one-third number would actually look a bit small now based on new predictions. So, so reefs are really in trouble. Um, and you know, we can look right here at the CNMI and see what's happened over the last decade. Um, there was a lot of research that's occurred out here really since 2010 when Peter Hauk came out and started doing his work. And there was a bleaching event in 2000, um, sorry, Peter Hauk started in 2000, and there was a big bleaching event in 2000 which led to 60 to 70 percent mortality of some of the reefs here, particularly the staghorn acroporas in the lagoon. Um, five years later, we had a smaller bleaching event, but this one was accompanied with a uh, crown of thorns starfish outbreak. and so. What was a small stress to the corals became a major stress to the corals um, on our four reef areas. In 2009 and 2011, so just after the TNC workshop I attended, um, we were on a high level of watch. Um, we were expecting severe bleaching conditions here based on 
models from satellites, but we had enough storm conditions and enough cloud cover and rain during that time that we actually didn't have any bleaching events during those summers, which was great. And we thought we might have something special here that protected us against some of those predictions, but this summer we learned that that wasn't necessarily the case because we had extensive bleaching again in the Saipan Lagoon. Um, and on Guam, the research suggests that certain coral species are bleaching all the way down to 50 feet on their four reefs. So now that we've talked a bit about why our reefs are in trouble and looked at a little bit of the history, the real question is, you know, what can we do about it? And there's really three options that I see. One is to address the source of the problem. Um, so try to reduce our carbon footprint. And certainly there's a lot of effort to try to raise awareness about this. But this is such a big and global problem that it's very difficult for us as reef managers to tackle directly. So one other solution that's been introduced is the idea of uh, technical solutions like shade structures or pumping of colder water during bleaching conditions to try to protect the reefs. Um, but these have really high engineering requirements, um, can be quite expensive, and actually create their own risks to reefs because a lot of times high bleaching seasons are also seasons where we have a lot of storm events. And if you have turnover of the water where you're breaking up potential man-made structures that you put in there to protect the reefs, you end up with a bunch of marine debris that ends up destroying your reefs. Um, so you have to be really careful in how you would try to implement these types of changes, and you really need a lot of resources to do it. So in a place like the CNMRI, where we're a little bit resource starved, um, we felt that the best approach was to develop local management to maximize the ability of reefs to resist change or to rebound from disturbance. So this requires an improved understanding of what's happening in our ecosystems here, and this can be achieved through new studies like, like this one. So after the 2009 TNC meeting, I came back and I talked to Fran Castro, who's our local POC, about possibly tracking down some funding to do research and add a bit more climate change work to what we do here. Um, and that got all of our local resource agencies involved, which led us to Stephen Johnson, um, who is the core biologist here and key contributor to all this research. Um, so once Steve got on the team and once the money came through from CRI, we were able to start looking for contractors, which is how we connected with Jeff Maynard. And then once we brought him into the mix, he again reached out to more local researchers and partners. So we had nonprofit agencies get involved. And it ended up just being a really dynamic, involved process. But it brought in a lot of partners. Um, and it really was key to our success that we had buy-in from just about everybody throughout this process. Um, everybody was interested and invested to see what the outcome would be. So in talking with Jeff, we also realized that to fully understand the reefs, uh, we needed to look more, to look at more than just developing new baselines. We needed to look at what the human influences were out on the reefs. We needed to continue to evaluate what's happening uh, with the ecosystems themselves. But we needed to define the key sets of parameters that we would put into trying to better understand the resilience of our reefs. And we found that um, we weren't the first to have done this. In 2003, Weston Psalm had put together a report that listed 60 variables that they thought were vital for evaluating the health and resilience of reefs. And then from 2003, 4 to 2009, 10, and 12, more work was done that eventually trimmed this number down to what was estimated to be about 31 key variables for reef resilience. So 31 variables is still very challenging. And arguably an unreasonable number of metrics to study for most projects. I know most of us don't have the kind of resources or expertise to address all of them that were suggested. So luckily for us, later in 2012, Tim McClanahan uh, led a survey of 28 scientists where they rated each of those 31 factors based on perceived importance, um, scientific evidence, and on feasibility. And they looked at this in terms of both resistance so whether or not the variable was important for allowing a site to be resistant to change, and then whether or not the variable helped with recovery after a disturbance. So they took the top 10 uh, perceived importance variables and the top 10 from scientific evidence, and that gave them a total of 13 different variables that were considered key for studying resilience on reefs. But two of those variables had really low feasibility scores. So they ended up trimming those off and coming up with 11 variables that were key for studying reef resilience. Four of those are anthropogenic stressors, and seven of those are ecological or physical stressors.
So in assessing and measuring these 11, uh, we'd be able to rank sites based on their resilience potential relative to the other sites locally. So in other words, comparing Saipan to itself or CNMI to itself. At this point, not comparing it across archipelagos. Now it's important to note that every area is different and that though these 11 variables are generally considered the top priorities across most regions, it's also important to think critically about what metrics might be important for you and your jurisdiction um, to add based on your needs. Um, but our work here was considered the first field-based trial to look at these 11 variables specifically um, as they were put out by the McClanahan report. So if we take a closer look at these 11 variables um, and how we approach them, it's important to know that we took a very quantitative approach. Um, if you wanted to look at these in a more qualitative way, you'd have to change some of how you do the assessment. Um, but we wanted to put a large degree of effort into making sure that our approaches matched what local resource managers were doing. We wanted the data to have value beyond just this report and to be directly comparable to the work that they're doing. So there is a, a very well documented report that goes through the methods um, and approach and findings for all this work. Um, you can follow up with me later and I can make that available. It's also available on Chorus. Here I'll just walk through the 11 variables and talk about what units we use. And if you see a variable that's highlighted in blue, it's one that I will go into detail in a separate slide. But if it's black, uh, we just don't have time today to address them all. So I'll say some things about them here. But if you want to make a note and ask a question at the end, I do have some other hidden slides here that I can pull up and we can talk about those other variables. So the highest ranking variable from the McClanahan report was bleaching resistance. And we chose to look at this as the percent of the community, the coral community at each site that was made up of bleaching resistant corals. Temperature variability was also considered key. Um, and here we used the standard deviation of summertime temperatures uh, based on satellite imagery at a four kilometer scale. Coral diversity for each site was evaluated using the Simpsons index. Herbivore biomass was evaluated at each site uh, using stationary point counts to develop a biomass per 100 meters squared. Coral disease was also looked at for each site. We tried to get a general abundance of the amount of coral that were affected by disease, but we actually got such little information on this variable that we couldn't include it in the model. So though we say we evaluated 11 variables, we really only evaluated nine because we also didn't get enough information about physical or human impacts uh, to include them in the study here. There are places on Saipan, like around Managaha, which is one of our key tourist areas, where you will see uh, direct impact from resource users or from tourists. But we didn't do survey work on any of those or directly in any of those locations. So this site, again, or this variable was not included in the final model. Macroalgae was included as a percent cover at each site. Recruitment for corals was also included based on the number of juvenile corals seen per meter squared from quadrat tosses. Nutrient input and sedimentation were also included. This was a tabletop exercise where we looked at GIS information um, based on watershed size and some land use information. And then fishing pressure was also included. But this proved to be a really challenging metric for us, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in another slide here. So in the spring of 2012, really just months after the McClanahan report was published, we were in the water collecting information for the 2012 Saipan study. As we go through some of our methods and findings, you will see a lot of the map here that's on the right. We often refer to Saipan as a long-necked dinosaur. His feet are on the east side, and his back and his hump are on the protected western lagoon side of the island. For this work, we sampled just about every reef location where we could string together three 50-meter transects on hard bottom within the 20 to 40-meter depth range. The 35 dots you see on the map are the sites we visited, and the numbers next to each dot will be the same on every map you see. They refer to the final relative resilience ranking. So the site with a 1 on it was the most resilient of all of our sites, and the site with a 35 was the least. The colors for each circle indicate how it scored for a particular metric. So here you see how the overall final rankings were scored. Um, you'll notice that there's hardly any red numbers here, but we'll get into how, or sorry, red dots, we'll get into how those scores were developed here as we go forward. So I, we thought it would be useful in particular to include information about herbivore biomass um, because fish can often be left out of these types of studies. It can be quite challenging to, to count and quantify fish, um, but we wanted to be sure it was included, especially as it scored as the fourth priority from the rankings from McClanahan. Um, and lucky for Jeff, uh, 
I count fish as a major part of what I do. So we had the expertise built into the staff, which was good. Um, so we wanted to go to the highest taxonomic resolution. And not everybody's going to be able to do this, but we wanted to be sure to include species level information because we know how um, important ESA can be in the jurisdictions, especially with recent petitions for damselfish and for corals. So we did five meter, three minute stationary point counts, um, nine replicates per site, identifying fish down to 10 centimeters. We just didn't have enough time to do fish smaller than that. And most of the herbivores were within that size range or bigger. Um, but taking it down to the species level allowed us to look at herbivores based on their functional groups. So we could look at details related to browsers, grazers, scrapers, or excavators. But for the study and for the map, the metric is based up just on the biomass total sum of all those herbivore functional groups. So sites on the red side of the spectrum had the lowest biomass, while green sites scored the highest. Um, and if you're familiar with Saipan, you may know that the neck of the dinosaur is one of our marine protected areas. It's Bird Island. And if you can see sites in that area scored highest with biomass during our surveys. So there's two sites up there, and they're both green. So fishing access um, for our study was a proxy for fishing pressure. We attempted to get real fishing effort information. There's creel studies that happen here on the island, uh, predominantly along the lagoon side. Um, then there's also been a nighttime spearfishing study um, commercial spearfishing study that's been done to collect information about catch and then some information about where the catch is occurring. Uh, but we realized that both of those studies, the information was either too limited in its geographic extent or uh, hadn't been vetted enough or wasn't available enough for us to include in this work. So we thought instead maybe we would interview managers. So we interviewed 20 reef fisheries uh, managers and asked them to rank each of the 35 sites around the island on a scale of high, medium, or low to give us an average of where we thought the most fishing pressure was occurring on the island. And we actually got a, a pretty good product from that survey. But again, we realized that that method just wasn't exportable. As we try to continue this work down to other locations like Tinian and Rota and hopefully Guam, we won't necessarily have the same type of uh, managers available for interview and the biases will change. And so we wanted something that could be done a little bit more consistently, which is when we looked at this a wave energy map that you see there on the left. And what we know about Saipan is that the eastern side, for most of the year, experiences very high wind and wave energy and is really hard to access. There's also not very many beaches there except for down in the area by Laulau. Whereas the western lagoon side, um, it's much calmer throughout most of the year, and much easier to access. And so we divided up the energy calculations and managed to define each site again as either low, medium, or high for wave energy as a proxy for fishing pressure. And we compared that, we cross-referenced that to the manager survey. And we found that when tiered, um, there was a very high level of agreement, more than 90% agreement between the manager survey and the wave calculations. So in the end, we ended up using wave energy. And what we found was a really bimodal distribution. So sites that are red had an estimated very high level of fishing pressure and sites that were green had very low. Um, and so the eastern side generally was very, very low, and the western side had very high fishing pressure. Um, and you'll notice a few anomalous circles in there. Those were marine protected areas. We gave them all the highest ranking possible and assumed that because they were no-take areas, uh, there would be very little fishing pressure there. So we also looked at sedimentation and nutrients. And it's important for most island communities to realize that the topography means that just about any raindrops that fall on the island are affecting the reef. So wherever you go, uh, where the water starts, it's going to come down and eventually impact one of our 35 sites. So as a proxy for, sorry, I keep going backwards there, guys. So as a proxy for sedimentation, um, we used GIS laters to estimate the percent of barren, urbanized, or highly developed land within each watershed. We also used information about the watershed size. For nutrients, the proxy, or pollution, the proxy was calculated as a continuous variable by measuring just the watershed size. So thus it was assumed that watershed size um, was a vital key for both variables. It ended up being almost disproportionately a contributor. Um, so though the color schemes are different in the two maps, the relative difference between sites was very similar, meaning that it 
if a site scored lower for sedimentation, it also scored lower for nutrient input with very little variation. So for future work, we're considering either merging these metrics into a combined watershed variable or looking for new ways to model them. Um, Jim Handy and Luke Grammer are actually working on sedimentation pools for the CNMI that should play directly into future work. Here you see a subset of the uh, species that were identified here, the coral species, and a list of their growth forms. Um, and the ranking for each species was based on a one to five scale, uh, where one being the least or most susceptible. Um, so this estimate, these numbers were based on literature, based on what's known about the growth forms, but also based on what we saw during the 2000 leaching event here. And for each side around the island, the proportion or the percent of the community that was made up of bleaching resistant corals was then calculated for each site. And you can see for this metric there was a wide range of scores. So if you stack up all these maps, you can get an idea of sort of how this uh, model is going to play out. Some variables like temperature here, which had only a small percentage change in the standard deviation of the summertime averages, had very little con contribution to the overall score because there was just very little difference between the sites. Herbivore bi biomass and bleaching resistance, as we just discussed, both had a pretty wide range between sites. And fishing access, as we mentioned, had a fairly bimodal high-low average between sites, making it a major contributor. But if you were to add up the colors and the circles for all those maps, this is what you would get. But it's not really that simple. <laughs> There's actually a little bit of math involved. So. Uh, we'll walk through the model here real quick. Once the data was collected, we needed to analyze it and develop a single composite score for resilience potential. The tables on the screen represent a subset of all data collected. The table on the top shows the raw data. The data on the bottom shows the scores once anchored and normalized. We've simplified the process into four steps. So the first step involves anchoring the data to the max value and then standardizing all the data to the uni uh, unidirectional scale of 0 to 1. A high score is always a good score, so for some variables we had to flip the scale, like for a macroalgae cover. So what you see here on top for recruitment for Forbidden Island was that we saw maybe in the neighborhood of 10 recruits per toss. That translated to, if you look down at the bottom circle, about 0.68 or almost 70% of what the highest score was. So the normalized scores were then averaged, and then these scores are all anchored to a maximum score so that the analyzed resilience potential can be expressed relative to the local max or best value according to the analysis. So here, here you see if you add up the anchored scores at the bottom across all nine variables that went into the study, the final resilience score for Forbidden Island was 0.84. And 0.84 was the highest score of all the sites, so that when re-anchored against all the sites gave Forbidden Island a value of 1. And here you can see that some other sites near the area also had scores very close to one. So once we had all that information, the sites were then ranked 1 through 35. Anything within 80% of the highest ranking was considered to have a high resilience potential. Um, and anything that was less than 60% of the final anchor, anchored resilience score was considered to have a low resilience potential. So these will shift as we add information from Rhoda and Tinian on possibly northern islands, uh, especially considering that some of those areas will have less anthropogenic influence and hopefully be more pristine sites. Um, so the, one of the real advantages about this approach is that um, it's all modeled using computers and can easily be rerun based on new information. So 23 of the 35 sites had a high resilience potential. Um, many of the sites are not really so different from one another with respect to the variables used in the analysis. Um, protected areas really seem to come up as some of the most important areas. And the medium and low resilience locations in the east were, seem to be mostly driven by water quality, uh, whereas in the south and west it was water quality combined with fishing access. Uh, we were surprised about the homogeneity around Saipan. We, we thought there might be a bit more extremes in here. Um, other, local, other locations are really likely to have greater contrast depending on um, what information you put into your variables. So the final maps that you see here on the left is the rankings high, medium, and low based on the tiering. And on the right, it's based on the 0 to 100 scale. And on the right, you see there are no red sites for Saipan. We didn't have any that scored extremely low. 
But the more extremes you have, and the more variation you have, um, the more easy it will be to translate some of this to management suggestions. So the photos on the left are representations of sites assessed as having high, medium, and low resilience. And you can see that there are um, high resilience sites here in the green seem to have higher coral cover and less macroalgae, whereas the sites at the bottom, some of those three sites that scored really low, tended to have much lower coral cover and, and higher macroalgae. Anchoring and normalizing the scores allowed statistical analysis. We used principal component analysis. And the PCA really helped to explain some of the variables um, as which were most important. We found that really, without exception, the high resilient sites have high scores for coral diversity, bleaching resistance, herbivore biomass, fishing access, and macroalgae cover. Whereas the three variables that were the lowest scoring had really low scores for bleaching resistance, herbivore biomass, and had high fishing pressure. So once we understand what's driving resilience at sites around the island, we were able to look at some management recommendations. So one of the things we did was review the placement of MPAs around Saipan. We also considered three different forms of area-based management, looking at areas that were highly influenced by anthropogenic activities, areas with high tourism value, and areas that came up as being highly susceptible to stress. We also looked at which targets uh, had the greatest island-wide influence. And we looked at site-based reporting, uh, which I'll explain more in an example when we talk about Tank Beach. And if your taxonomic resolution is high enough, you could also look for broader implications for some of these things, like for ESA. So when we talk about our MPAs, uh, it was really interesting to see how they scored. Forbidden Island came up um, as the number one site of all of our sites. Bird Island came up number two. I think you see a trend here. And then Monagaha, which had four sites within the, within the uh, survey area, came up three, five, and then a couple of them in the 20s that were a little bit more on the outskirts of the MPA or in the lagoon area, which has uh, much reduced coral diversity. So either the management in those areas appears to be working, uh, or um, somehow the MPAs may have contributed to variables that gave them a higher score. It's probably a combination of both, because the MPAs did get um, set to a maximum score for fishing pressure, for example. Um, but you could use this tool, once you run it through this process, to identify locations in your jurisdiction where you might want to consider putting new MPAs, if that's a management approach that you guys want to consider in your jurisdiction. Uh, protected areas are not a particularly popular approach right now in Saipan, but this study validated um, their their usefulness, at least in terms of creating ecological spillover by holding on to sites that score high in resilience. So anthropogenic inputs uh, were driven largely by fishing access, though nutrient inputs and sedimentation were important. And you'll see here that lagoon areas and portions of Lalao Bay seem to score the lowest or be the most impacted by anthropogenic inputs. Um, and this is, this is interesting because Lalao Bay and Garapan area, which feeds into the lagoon, are also two areas where we recently performed and are implementing conservation action plans. So it was good to see that areas that came up as a need for anthropogenic changes are also areas where we're already starting to move forward with important um, solutions for watershed management. So we also identified areas that appear to have uh, high relative resilience and are important for tourism value. And we're going to be looking at ways uh, down in Obzon, on the southern part of the island, to promote tourism at those locations that seem to have these high resilience scores. Um, management measures will also be used to ensure that the relative resilience potential of those sites stays high. So with regard to island-wide threats, herbivore biomass and fishing pressure were two of the most important variables throughout Saipan and two of the, of the most likely to benefit from having island-wide man management measures. So luckily for us, we had two of the most proactive fisheries management regulations here with gear restrictions for both uh, gill nets, surround nets, drag nets, and collection and harvesting with scuba. You can't use nets without a very special permit, and they don't give very many of those out, and you cannot do any kind of harvesting with scuba. You can't grab a lobster. You can't use a spear gun. So we felt that it was very important to maintain these regulations and increase enforcement activities um, wherever possible um, to keep the resilience potential for these high at all sites. 
The sites with the lowest resilience potential based on this work were all found in the Cyclone Lagoon and all had very low scores for bleaching resistant corals and high fishing pressure. These are all staghorn cropper areas that were known to have bleached during 2000 and also that bleached during the summer here in 2013. So we felt that these sites would be important to consider increased monitoring, possibly involving community monitoring, and to ensure a high level of enforcement for those fishing regulations to make sure that we don't reduce the herbivore biomass in those locations anymore. So in addition to the main report, we developed an appendix with a detailed two-pager for each of the 35 sites that could be used for site-based reporting. Shortly after the report came out, we were able to use this information as a reference for Tank Beach. NRCS wanted to track down funding for stormwater improvements in Kagman, just above our Tank Beach site. And we knew that Tank Beach was a low resiliency score site from the model, um, that it scored actually 31st out of 35 total sites. So in looking at the appendix, we were able to pull out the nutrient and sediment anchored scores. And here you can see that the nutrient and sedimentation anchored scores were at zero. So this is the lowest possible score that can be received. Um, and these are the two variables we'd expect to benefit most from improvements in stormwater management. So we told our NRCS, yes, absolutely, we think stormwater improvements are key for improving resilience at Tank Beach. Um, and though we don't have the funds to give you, um, they were actually looking for several millions of dollars, you know, hopefully this reference um, and the need shown here in you know, this document will help NRCS track down the funding for those improvements. The appendix also lists all of the petitioned and proposed coral species for each site. So here's a list of the petitioned or proposed corals that were seen at Tank Beach. And here's all of them that were seen at all 35 sites. So across the top for threatened, those were the NIMPS proposed coral species for threatened listing uh, that are currently proposed. The not warranted are those that were petitioned but were eventually removed by NIMPS as, as not warranted. So the take home message here is that around Saipan at the 35 sites that we visited, there were only two that didn't have at least one proposed threatened species found at it, which was rather telling and, and useful for our partners at Pyro and protected resources when they were trying to figure out where these species are found. So our next steps, we really want to continue to communicate the results and approach to the international and scientific and management community through publications and technical reports and really through presentations like this one. We want to continue to work with managers uh, to apply and update results of remote sensing, climate and resilience analysis, refine our understanding of spatial variability and anthropogenic stressors. So we want to develop more how-to guides through global collaborative input to increase uptake and usability of this information and to further develop a community of practice and exchange of learning and experiences. We also want to target areas that have high coral diversity during bleaching events. I think some of this was done here and on Guam when we had this recent bleaching event this summer. And we want to expand the approach and analysis to look at other islands. So we've already been funded for work on Rota by USGS and we applied for funding for Tinian uh, for the Coral Reef Conservation Program. We're hoping to get funded there. And eventually we want to look to Guam and hopefully the Northern Islands. So we want to incorporate advances from other researchers. And this is a really exciting time to be involved in resilience research. With NOAA alone, we're currently coordinating with more than six other researchers who are either working on contributions that will extend the range of this work or improve some of the methods and metrics that drive the results. So output products thus far, there's the report and the appendix for the Saipan work. There's also a how-to guide that's been put together by Jeff through TNC. If you want to look at resilience assessments, it gives you some ideas on how to do that. And then there's publications uh, that will be moving forward, um, including work once we finish Rota and hopefully Tinian. So our emails are here. Um, you can reach out to me or Jeff, or if you're interested in talking to Stephen Johnson about more coral specific stuff, just let me know. A note about the effective uh, collaboration. So this has just been a really great effort between local and federal managers and researchers. Um, it drew the community in. And for me, it's, it's really been a model for how future projects should be run. Um, we're happy to share everything that we've learned throughout the process. And I hope you guys have a lot of questions for me. Thank you.
Thank you, Steve. So now it's time for questions, and you can raise your hand, and we can unmute you and call on you, which is definitely preferred because it makes us know that there's other people out there instead of just me talking. So please raise your hand, and I'm going to go ahead and start with a question that I got um, chatted to me. So one of the questions was, why wasn't uh, a measurement of pH part of the resilience measures? So uh, pH was not one of the key metrics that came out of the work, uh, the assessments done by McClanahan when he surveyed those researchers. So if you, let me unhide this slide here. So if you can see this slide, when the 31 most important variables for understanding uh, reef health, reef resilience are listed here, and when they interviewed the 28 researchers regarding which ones were a priority, from what their understanding was, um, it was trimmed down to that 11. Sorry, I can't see the whole list here. But I think, uh, is pH on there? Do you see it? Um, let's see. So if it's not on here, then it must have been weeded out from the original 60 Before. for some reason. Mm -hmm. But my guess is with the importance of ocean acidification, uh, it may be getting reintroduced as a consideration for sites, especially sites where you might expect differential pH. Um, if you mm -hmm. think that there's something that might be protecting a site against having effects of ocean acidification. Okay, thanks. Um, another question is, uh, what kind of resources did it take to run this kind of study, and are there recommendations you have around uh, scaled down versions if people can't come up with the kind of resources it took for the scale of study you did? Yes. Yeah, we, we were pretty lucky. Um, we didn't actually spend a lot of money. We spent less than $50,000 on all this work. Um, we had built in capabilities though, Stephen Johnson and I both volunteered all of our time or we considered this to be supporting of requirements for our ongoing work. So there was no extra expenditure for either the coral or fish portions of the study, um, which cut down on costs greatly. We also found uh, some alternate solutions for boating, which helped cut some of the costs. Um, so we're very grateful for some of our local partners who provided some go boat access for us. Uh, but if you want to scale this down, um, Jeff had mentioned to me that he thought some locations might want to go with a more qualitative approach to the data rather than trying to be as quantitative as we were. Um, and if you do that, you have to change the way in which you apply some of the model, but that can be done. And he felt that um, if people were really interested in moving forward with that, he could provide some solutions. There might also be some solutions to that here in the TNC how-to guide talking about more qualitative versus more quantitative approaches. Um, but for us, the, the biggest cost wasn't so much financial, it was time. It took a year to process and get the grant money. It took us another year to hire the PI. It took us six months to map out what we wanted to do, two months in the water, and then another six months or so to finish up the reports. So top to bottom, you've got to have people who are committed to the project for multiple years you know, if you have high turnover, uh, it can obviously have a dramatic impact on whether or not you can finish a study like this. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, Rod Salm has his hand up. So, Rod, I'm going to call on you. Hopefully, it'll work. Rod? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Yep. Um, yeah. Hi, Steve. And thank you. I, I've read the materials in the reports. So I'm fairly familiar with it. But um, a, a couple of things. First of all, I think the, the list of we didn't know what the variables would be for OA at the time. And, and this was really targeted at, at warming and mass coral bleaching um, independently of OA, which is, I, I think, um, the other part of the, the answer to the question that was posed earlier. Also, um, what, um, earlier in your talk, you made a, what I think is a really relevant point that comes back to the, one of the other questions, and that is that you, you said you, you chose these 11 variables and you chose the method you did, but in some occasions, or in some places, the methods might have to be um, uh, tailored to suit the local situation. And, and that's absolutely key because 
it does take a lot of money and it does take a lot of time, as we know. And we also know that sometimes you have opportunities to, to uh, protect areas and there's a very small window of time to provide the answers. And we have to respond quickly, which means we don't have that time that you, you outlined it took to get the money in place and the PI in place and so on. We have to do things quicker. And a, a, as a case in point, the, the resilience assessments are being done at the moment throughout FSM. And, uh, and that in speaking about the methods at length with Yim, Yim Nangolbu, um, who, who those who are familiar with the Pacific will know, but he is the director of the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And um, probably the most uh, experienced um, Micronesian PhD scientist looking at reefs and resilience. And, um, and he came up with a, a much simpler method and he, that, that is based on the ability of the local people to implement um, and to understand, to implement and un understand the assessments and know how to, you know, understand what, how the data are analyzed and how they're applied as they are the people who after the study is done are going to have to continue the work and uh, through their monitoring programs. And that's a, that's a valid point. You know, the, the question is how we can have sets of variables sort of nested within each other that, that, um, that apply to different situations. So you go down your decision tree and you say, yeah, I've got a good chunk of money and a good capacity and a good sciences, scientists in place and a good monitoring program. I can go for and I've got the time to do it. And so that's a good, you know, at some point you talked about refining the process. And so that's something to feed into that thinking of how you refine it. I think that having a series of nested sets of variables that, that apply in different situations with different local capacities, different levels of funding would be really, really useful. All right. Well, thanks, Rod. Steve, do you have anything to say to Rod's comments, or would you like me to uh, do it? Sure, I'd just add that um, in the CNMI, for example, we just recently had a larval distribution study uh, put in play. It's going to be completed here fairly soon, and that's going to be one of the metrics that we look at, including in our next process, because it's available. And mm -hmm. so sometimes you've just got to work with what's available to you, and if you cannot take it to some of the taxonomic levels or um, to some of the details that we did here. I, I think that that doesn't mean that the research doesn't still have great value for you in understanding what's happening with your reefs. So, yeah, thanks a lot for those comments. It's excellent. All right. Um, I'm going to take another hand that's up. I think it's Clarice Hutchins. Um, Clarice, can you hear us? Clarice? I think, I'm not sure how to say your name. Are you... Can you talk and ask your question? Mm. Hello? All right, well, we'll see if they can, wait, I almost heard something. Well, do you have a question? All right, well, if they come on, great. I'm going to ask another question that I got um, from um, one of our network members in Kenya, right, Terry? Kenya, yeah. So um, one of the questions, um, his name is January, he sent in, he said, in my reef resilience survey, I presented recruitment survivorship as a percentage of coral recruits, mean density, that survive from size class 1 to 2 centimeters and 5 to 6 centimeters colonies. Mm. And that percentage above 100% indicated accumulation of recruits in larger size class while the percentage below 100 indicates mortality. Is there an alternative way of presenting this survivorship? That's a long question, I know. But yeah, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to defer that one to our coral expert. So the way Stephen Johnson approached this, and I believe this was based on input from Peter Hauck, um, they just looked at the number of small corals that appeared to be growing um, during quadrat tosses. And so there wasn't a repeat visit to see how many of those actually were continuing to grow versus not. 
um, but they may have some ideas on how to move forward with that. So um, let me know, and, and I can send an email for Stephen Johnson or Peter Hopp for him to follow up. Perfect. All right. So we have another question here from Scott Heron. Scott, let's see if we can we'll unmute you. I think I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I um I just wanted to to connect on from uh, from Rod's comment there of uh, you know the capacities and and the ability to do this. One thing I really appreciate about this study, Steve, is that uh, where available or where necessary, you've used desktop information uh, to to evaluate you know out of the the eleven uh, numbers there, and and having a, a desktop so that's something you don't have to go in the field. Um, to access uh, some are, are actual measurements, the remote sensing. Some are proxies, the the uh, the fishing pressure pressure as you've discussed. Um, do you know if there is an example of these desktop proxies or measurements uh, that is a part of the how-to guide uh, that you mentioned, the TNC how-to guide? I haven't seen that document myself, which is my own fault, and I've written down to go and get it. Um, but I'm just wondering if, if there's a, a breakdown of stuff people really have to get in the, the water to measure versus stuff that's available uh, from a computer. You know, unfortunately, this is a great question for Jeff, and he's in the air on his way to Australia right now since he helped put that guide together. I don't know if it provides possible solutions to these metrics, both as an in-water and as a desktop solution, and which ones are preferable to do one way or the other. I think. You just have to look at what resources are available to you and your jurisdiction. I know we were looking at possibly trying to do this work on Guam without getting in the water as much because they have a lot of existing data for fish information at certain sites and for what's happening with coral and now with coral bleaching actually activities that have happened there this summer. Um, but Jeff had felt like that was still going to be a considerable effort to try to sift through all of the existing data. Um, instead of jumping in the water to recollect it with the same exact method and approach that we used here, um, trying to come up with ways to make those connections without following the exact same protocol is a bit of a challenge. Um, but I don't know specifically what's in that document either. It sounds like we should like, get a copy of it at some point. Yeah, we should. Um, <laughs> Rod, Rod, I hope you're listening to that. Um, <laughs> yes, we will get a copy of that soon. <laughs> All right. Um, Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Scott, for the questions. Um, we have another question, Steve. Um, this is going back to your discussion of, I think, the anthropogenic kind of sedimentation work you did. Does the sedimentation uh, contain soil that has iron or other minerals that encourage al algae growth? That is the question. So in our assessment for sedimentation, which was based really on the watershed size, so using GIS, and then also the percent of the watershed that was made up of either barren or urban land, um, we considered that to strictly be sedimentation that was entering the water column in a negative way. In other words, stuff that would be coming in and, and covering up or, or reducing the ability for recruitment for corals. Um, we did not look at it in terms of how it might be contributing to positive growth. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another hand up, so it's Rod again. Rod? Uh, Rod, are you there? Oh. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. Rod, are you still no. there? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I just wanted to say very briefly that I'm actually, as we are speaking, I have an email open to Scott to send him that resilience assessment method. <laughs> and I'm looking hard for it. And um, and when I find it, I'll send it. And if, if you know, maybe um, uh, uh, Petra, you could, people could send you a message if they want copies and um, and I, I'll arrange to. Yes, for sure. Yeah, okay. Great. I've read it many times and I don't recall the answer to the question either, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, 
One more question. Uh, wait, am I still on? Steve, uh, um, in regards, a lot of interest in acidification. Um, would carbon sinks such as seagrass and mangroves decrease the risk of local acidification? Boy, you know, we didn't go into ocean acidification very much for this work. Um, as Rod mentioned, OA, when they were prioritizing these variables since 2003, has kind of emerged as a major issue that wasn't necessarily on the list um, for variables they were looking at at the time. So my guess is that there could be local influences that would help areas be more resistant to OA than others, um, but exactly which those are going to be and in what degree, um, I'm not sure, and it was not a portion of the study. Okay, thanks. So if you were to do anything different in this study, what, what, would, what would you do differently if you were to do it again? Well, we, we are going to do it again. <laughs> we're oh, uh, right. we're going to add Rhoda and then hopefully add Tinian. And when we do that, we will rerun all the information from Saipan um, against both those new anchoring points, but also including any of the new methods that we're able to tie in. Um, so one of the things for sure that we're going to change is how we look at sedimentation and nutrients. Um, we realize they're important, but the way in which we ran them from a desktop perspective was limited, and they ended up not being different enough from each other for us to really justify them being two separate metrics. So that's one of the things that we're definitely going to get in there and fix. Um, but also, knowing all these other researchers who are working on portions of this work, I, I really hope that we have a chance this time to include them more and incorporate more of the brand new movements in the science <clears throat> into the work going forward. So I wouldn't change much about what we did previously, but I would definitely make some changes as we go forward. And certainly, more and more partnerships is always a plus. And for our final question, um, it's along those lines. You know, it, you showed that you had excellent partnerships to to really have a lot of parties involved in the design and implementation of this study. What is your advice on engaging managers in these kind of studies so that the information gets used? Yeah, we were really lucky because, I mean, technically I work for the Pacific Islands Regional Office, so that's the management arm of NOAA. Steve works for the Division of Environmental Quality, uh, so that's a research but also a management arm of the local government here. I came from the Division of Fish and Wildlife, which is the fisheries management agency here on Saipan. And so we had a lot of connections already within the guys doing the research to the guys who could potentially implement it as management. And so we were able to think very you know, hard about what types of recommendations are practical for them and make sense in the current political climate and everything else that is going on here so that we didn't you know, put our foot in our mouth when we came out with a report that said, hey, you know, we need to add a whole bunch of new marine protected areas to Saipan or something like that, which we, we know because we live and work here just would not make any sense um, in the current political climate. So I guess uh, advice would be to, if, if you're not connected directly as we were with what's happening in the area where you're doing the work, make sure that you reach out to those people who are. Um, you know, I'm sure that's one of the things that Yim is doing in Micronesia. And one of the reasons why they have to take a little bit more of a quantitative approach is because they're trying really hard to tie in all the local users and managers as much as possible at the beginning. Because the sooner that they're brought in, the more buy-in there will be with the rec recommendations that come out at the end. All right. Thanks. Well, we are out of time for our webinar. And I want to thank you for joining us as a participant. And I want to thank Steve McKagan for being a great presenter. The recording of this webinar, as well as the resource links, will be sent out to the Reef Resilience Network email list um, after today. If you're not on that list and would like to be, please email us at resilience, uh, no, resilience at tnc.org and send any suggestions for future webinar topics that you'd like to see us presenting on, because we will try to find those presenters and get the information out there. Um, please tune in to our next webinar in December. Uli Kolber and Kevin McDonald from the Chumbe Island Coral Park are going to present on the private nonprofit nature reserve, specifically focusing on sustainable financing of the park. 
and we'll be sending out information on the date and time for that webinar in the upcoming weeks. So thanks again for participating, and thanks, Steve, for the presentation. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.